Sure. I want to thank uh, Professor Rana Mitter. Uh, he is Professor of the History and Politics of Modern China and the Director of the China Center at the University of Oxford, working especially on the emergence of nationalism in modern China. He's the author of several books, including Modern China, A Very Short Introduction, uh, published in 2008, and then again, a second edition in 2016. He's also the award-winning author of A Bitter Revolution, China's Struggle with a Modern World in 2004. More recently, he's published a pair of books um, that I feel every student of China, and some of them are in, the, in the, the Zoom meeting today, every student of China must now reckon with. Uh, Forgotten Ally, China's World War II, 1937 and 1945, um, which is named a book of the year uh, by The Economist and the Financial Times. Um, and the topic of today's discussion, the book, China's Good War, how World War II is shaping a new nationalism. This book examines the importance of World War II through popular and official memory and is a window uh, as a window, it's arguably uh, one of the most important windows, I feel, uh, to understanding China today, both domestically and on the world stage. Rana Mitter has commented on Asia for the BBC, CNN, NPR, The Guardian, Telegraph, Xijing, Outlook India, and The New York Times, The History Channel, and the World Economic uh, Conference at Davos. And he is a fellow of the British Academy and an officer of the Order of the British Empire. His television documentary, The Longest War, China's World War II, was broadcast on the History Channel Asia in summer 2015. Um, and I'll add a link to this uh, and other related materials to it in the chat um, and the, the, the video uh, details below. Um, please join me in, in giving a virtual uh, warm welcome to Professor Rana Mitter. Thank you so much, Rana, for joining us. Thanks very much indeed to Professor Murray for hosting this event, Jeremy. It's a great pleasure to see you, um, even at the kind of pandemic distance, which is forced upon all of us at the moment. And thank you to everyone who's joined us. I think if you're mostly in California, I will say this morning, even though I'm actually speaking from Oxford uh, in England, where the uh, twilight is making it darker and darker. So we're on the other side of the, the day here. Um, I'd also like to say that uh, I know that some of you have actually been kind enough to read some or all of China's Good War, which is very generous of you in terms of your time, and I hope you'll have questions and thoughts on it. Uh, even if you have, I hope there'll be something for you in this talk, because I've got various images which uh, I wasn't able to put in the book, but which may be therefore new to you for this particular talk, so that's great. Um, and I think there may be some people also who um, have not read the book, which is absolutely fine. I will speak also to those people and I hope be reasonably accessible. Uh, even without any uh, prior reading uh, necessary. Uh, what I'll also do is to speak with a PowerPoint presentation for about 30 minutes or so, which will leave us another good half hour or so for a bit of back and forth question and answers and so forth. So I'm hoping we'll kind of split between the presentation side of things and the more interactive side of things, both of which uh, I hope will be uh, part of our discussion today. Uh, and I will first of all test the wonders of this technology by seeing if I can share screen with all of you. Now, let's see, can we get that going? Yes, I believe we can. Slideshow from a dick. Great. Fantastic. Okay, so to start off my comments today, I need to just show you two images and uh, when I've done that, I'll explain why I've shown them. So the first one is this one, and it is the uh, DVD box uh, back from the days when DVDs actually existed as a thing before Netflix uh, in the past, you know, distant uh, realms of history. Uh, and it's a, a DVD box for uh, the Pacific, which some of you might remember was released just over 10 years ago, 2010, um, on HBO. Uh, as the successor to the massively successful Band of Brothers produced by Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. And the Pacific uh, wasn't as much of a kind of gangbuster hit as uh, Band of Brothers, but it was still pretty popular. And it was the tale of uh, a group of US Marines fighting in the Pacific theater of World War II in the last year or so of that war. Okay, let me now show you this image. And you may or may not have seen this film, uh, Dong Feng Yu, uh, East Wind Rain, um, released in exactly the same year as you uh, see from the caption, also released in 2010 uh, for the Chinese market. And this movie, uh, again, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's worth a watch. It's a thriller. It's set just before Pearl Harbor, 1940. 
one. And it tells the tale, at least as the movie tells it, of how um, spies working for the Chinese Communist Party find out that the Japanese are going to bomb Pearl Harbor. And they get information, you know, all the way to Washington for the attention of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. But the Americans just don't pay any attention to what they say. And so you know, Pearl Harbor happens anyway. Um, in other words, a kind of object lesson in how the um, American authorities, even back in 1941, should have paid more attention to what the Chinese said, and indeed, specifically what the Chinese Communist Party said. I should add that there is absolutely no historical evidence whatsoever of any Chinese information being passed on to Washington this way. Uh, it's a very entertaining film, but the scenario is entirely fictional, just to make that clear. Okay, so please hold those two items in mind. I'm going to stop sharing images for a minute and just read you a uh, passage, if I may. Let me just get to uh, get to that. Um, oh, uh, Jeremy, Professor Murray, could I just ask if you if your um, sound is your own sound is muted because uh, for some reason my Zoom is picking you up still. Not to worry if 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 not. Yes, um, I am. I am muted. I'm not sure. Are you getting feedback? What's that? I am I am muted. Are, are oh, okay? Just um, it's just it's just coming up with your name. It doesn't matter anyway. Just okay. to say, it's not affecting anything. Just to say that I'm getting Jeremy Murray in big letters, which is just as it uh, it uh, it should be. All okay, right. so these two um, these two new productions uh, hit the American and Chinese screens, as I've explained, in the year 2010. Now, during that year, a blog also appeared. Um, in uh, China, put forward actually by one of China's best known bloggers of the era. Uh, some of you may even have read his work, uh, Sima Pingbang, a well known leftist commentator of the era. Uh, and he co wrote this uh, blog, uh, which had a title, uh, had the title, Why are China and the United States both rewriting the history of the Pacific War? And this blog looks at both of these items the Pacific, the HBO series, uh, TV series and the movie uh, Dong Feng Yu, uh, East Wind Rain. And analyzing these fictional works, uh, Sima Pingbang, this blogger, detects a wider discourse in both countries to claim a political legacy, a political legacy from the Second World War. So quote, if you peel below the surface of the stories of justice and heroism, then there is this hidden tendency towards conspiracy and competition in their own interests. And end quote, uh, on the Chinese side, they suggest that although East Wind Rain is not a kind of overtly nationalistic production, nonetheless, it's still subtly trying to give China the upper rhetorical hand by suggesting that Pearl Harbor was an American failure that could have been solved by heeding Chinese um, advice. And by implication, of course, this is a rejection of the long held view that China was nothing more than a victim during the war, waiting to be saved by the Americans. And when they comment on the Pacific, the American HBO show, they argue that, quotes, this theory says, because the Americans saved people from the claws of the demon Japanese, uh, their term, not mine, I hasten to add, the claws of the demon Japanese, that is why the US now has got the strongest army in the world, end quote. And they conclude this uh, blog discussion of these two movies, or one movie, one TV series, I should say, with the following words. <laughs> The release of these two films is not just about their plots or performances. Just as the US lets the world know that at a most dangerous time for humanity, it bore burdens and made sacrifices. So China has finally dared to propagate in the same way that during the war, it also bore burdens and sacrifices. This represents another type of continuity of the competition over politics, economics, and culture of these two countries. Now, what I should um, what I should point out is that this particular phenomenon, this comparison of this American and this Chinese take on World War II in popular culture, is part of a much wider phenomenon, which is what the book China's Good War, um, which I'll briefly show for those who have not uh, seen it yet, um, and I've had a comment actually coming through on direct message about the cover, so I'm not going to address that now, but I'll address that in a few minutes. So, uh, Sunny Lin, your moment is coming. Um, and what it talks about is the way in which collective social memory of the Second World War experience in China has shaped in many ways 
all sorts of aspects of China's public life in the last 40 years or so. And these aspects can vary from diplomacy in the kind of highest level of the, the diplomatic uh, um, universe to popular TV uh, shows, movies, uh, museums, but also the way in which collective memory of people's family experiences have been uh, uh, understood and reappropriated as well. In other words, this is a phenomenon that's about propaganda. That's what people tend to think of when they first think of this subject, but it's so much more than that in all sorts of important ways. To understand the significance of it, I do need to, I think, spend a minute, maybe two, just giving a quick outline, which will be known by some of you, but perhaps not all of you, of what happened to China in World War II. Because of all the theatres of the Second World War, an event which Westerners tend to think they know pretty well, the Chinese theatre is probably the least well known of those. And although I don't, because of this, have a, um, uh, a time to go through the entire history of World War II in, in, in China, it's worth just giving a few bullet points to remind you of how important it was. It was the longest single theatre of World War II uh, between 1937 and 1945, uh, starting as a Sino-Japanese war, but ending up, of course, as part of the Asian theatre of World War II. During those years, uh, the statistics that we have, and they're often hard to pin down, suggest that more than 10 million Chinese civilians and military were killed, that 80 to 100 million Chinese became refugees in their own country. That's certainly according to the figures of uh, scholars such as Stephen McKinnon of Arizona State, who've looked at this in, in great detail. And also, and not incidentally, something like half a million Japanese troops were held down by Chinese uh, uh, resistance until Pearl Harbor in 1941. So in other words, Chinese uh, soldiers fought for four and a half years, essentially alone, uh, with a certain amount of covert foreign assistance before actually coming to um, uh, into the the alliance, which uh, marked the second phase of the war from 1941 to 45, an alliance with the British and the Americans. And you can see aspects of the Second World War experience in all sorts of um, places in China today. And I'm going to talk about one or two of those in a minute. But uh, certainly international diplomacy has become part of that mixture, and you hear plenty of references to the 1945 order and China's place in it from leaders from Xi Jinping down uh, these, uh, these days. So it's worth noting that, as I say, this is a phenomenon that goes all the way from popular culture to international diplomacy. But what I want to do today, because time is limited, is for the next 15, 20 minutes or so, talk about one particular aspect of that. That doesn't mean by any means for those, by, by, uh, by any means that for those of you who have been kind enough to read the book, if you want to talk about different aspects of it, I'm very happy to do that. But in limited time, I'm going to talk about one aspect. And that aspect is the way in which the changing collective memory of China's World War II experience is affecting its international relations in particular. In other words, how its use of World War II history from 75 or 80 years ago is still today in the 2020s, shaping the way that China thinks about itself in the world. Now, the first thing to say, and there are a lot of historians, I think, on this call, is that this is not something that just happened yesterday or even within the last few years. It's a phenomenon that's been, I would say, at least 40 years in the making as part of that wider era of revisionism that came with reform in the 1980s. And one particular figure who I think is, is, is very significant to that is, and I'm just going to share again, this person here. Where are we going? Here we go. Uh, but, 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 where are we? Oops, sorry, here we go. Yeah, uh, Hu Chiaomu. And some of you will be familiar with Hu Chiaomu, uh, very, very senior and, um, how can one put it, um, hardline figure, I think is the way I put it, in the context of um, the, uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, stop sharing for a moment. Okay. There. Um, he was Mao's personal secretary, he was in Yan'an, he was an important historian, but also a major sort of figure of ideological rectitude during much of the mid to late 20th century. And because of his sort of unimpeachable rectitude in terms of, uh, of the Communist Party and its hold over China after 1949, 
his views, I think, are immensely significant in terms of shaping uh, China's discourse about itself, which makes the editorial that Hu Xiaomu wrote in the, or published in the People's Daily in 1987, um, a really very significant turning point, I think. He writes about the, quotes immense significance of World War II, the war of resistance against Japan, as it's still, its China theater is still known in, in China today, the Kang Zhan that many of you will have um, encountered. But in doing that, he makes a clear case in this 1987 uh, editorial about why the war is so significant. And he says, the great significance of the war of resistance is that it fundamentally changed the international politics of the Far East. He uses that term, Yuan Dong, by the way, uh, which I directly translate as Far East, even though clearly we would say East Asia. Uh, before the conclusion of the eight years of the War of Resistance, he goes on, Japanese imperialism was running wild. And then he runs through a series of sequences after that. He says that in 1945, the Soviet army eliminated the Guangdong army and entered Korea. Then you get the atomic bombings of Japan. Then you get the Japanese adopting the peace constitution. Then new powers, including China, sit in judgment on Japan at the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, i.e. the Tokyo Trials, as they're uh, still known, the Dongjin Shampan. Hu Chabu then reached the end point of his teleology in this long editorial. He says, then just a year later, the PRC declared its foundation. The old China, called the sick man of East Asia, would not return. At the same time, he said, the old structure of the Far East and the old structure of the world would not return. Now, again, I should just point out, because they are terms that you know can, for good reasons, um, uh, offend some, that sick man of East Asia and Far East are both terms that Hu Tiamu himself used in the document. Uh, so my translation, but his terms, just to be clear about that. Several decades on, Hu Tiamu's statement appears as if it was a sort of incipient version of a new version of internet vision of international order waiting to come into being. Don't forget, back in 1987, the Cold War had not ended. At that point also, China and the US were still somewhat closer to each other than either was to the Soviet Union. In other words, Hu Tamu was writing this at a time when the kaleidoscope of geopolitics was really, really different from what it is in the present day. And that's why I think it's so significant that actually looked at 40 years on, what he, what he said actually seemed in some ways quite prescient because it was, I think, sketching out what would later become much more concrete in what we live with today, which is the growing significance of China in international affairs. So when Hu Tiamu says that a large part of the war's significance was to do with international order, he meant that he was framing the end of World War II, 1945, as the point of origin for the contemporary international system. Well, big deal, you may say, what's so big about that? But in China in 1987, that is a big deal because bearing in mind, you know, even today, 1949, the foundation of the PRC is obviously a tremendously important turning point. To put 1945 as a complementary but alternative starting point for the emergence of the international system, not just the foundation of Mao's China, is something that is you know, really quite unusual and daring at that point. And Hu Tiamu's summary that I gave you of some of the major um, actions in terms of the changes in China's position after 1945 include actions undertaken by, of course, this is the really crucial change, the Guomindang, the old nationalists, the uh, KMT, the former, uh, the opponents of the Chinese communists who eventually would be kicked off the mainland. And the foundation of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, uh, of the People's Republic of China in 1949, in the way that Hu Tiamu puts it, is seen as the end point of a sequence of events in which what the Guomindang did was also very, very important in a way that wouldn't have been possible to say in the era of Chairman Mao. And that, by the way, to answer Sonny Lin's question that was sent in the in, in the chat, is why, uh, so Sonny said, uh, have you noticed that the flag is wrong on the front of the book? Let me show you the book again. So you'll see that the, the decoration of the flag is, of course, the flag of the People's Republic of China. And Sonny's saying very sensibly, why isn't it the Republic of China, the uh, old uh, Guomindang flag? And the reason, of course, is that the whole point of the argument that's being made by the PRC today 
is that without ever stating it, they are taking on and appropriating the post-war actions of the Kuomintang and making them part of a new narrative, a new trajectory in which essentially both Chinese regimes are seen to have acted legitimately in international society. In other words, you might say that Chiang Kai-shek wrote a series of checks back in the 1940s, which the CCP today is cashing. And that's why that flag is the PRC flag and not the Republican flag. Let me um, explain specifically what I mean by that. And to do that, let me move you a quarter of a century on from 1987 to 2013, uh, the year 2013. And to do that, let me go back to the screen and go back to the slides. Okay, there's Hu Jiamu, looking quite smiley, actually. He wasn't always a very jolly character, but here he is. Right, here we have an event which may be familiar to you, but just a reminder. 1943, November, the Cairo Conference during World War II. And the um, event itself uh, was re reached its 70th anniversary in the year 2013, as I mentioned. And suddenly Chinese media was filled with a whole bunch of you know discussions about the Cairo conference and its significance and most westerners were looking at this saying huh you know what what gives why remember this historically you know interesting but rather obscure conference during world war ii well actually during world war ii the conference itself was very interesting as you see from the picture uh chiang kai-shek fdr winston churchill and madame chiang kai-shek sumailing are all sitting together in kind of equal status and this was actually the first time that a chinese leader had been given this kind of formal equal ally role uh, in terms of china's status in the wider world so symbolically it had a lot of importance but it wasn't the symbolism that essentially made um uh, China's uh, um, government and uh, you know, its uh, propaganda arm so keen to talk 70 years on about the, the conference itself. It was essentially because of the formulation that was used at the end, the communique that was put out at the end of the, uh, the conference at the beginning of December 1943, when the three allies, the Chinese, the British, the Americans, not the Soviets, who of course were neutral in the war against uh, uh, the war in Asia at that time, but the three powers said that basically once the war was won, various small islands would be redistributed to uh, from Japan to other powers, and it was never specified exactly which islands. But seventy years on, the Chinese government was very keen to claim that the islands known as Senkaku to the Japanese, Diaoyu to the uh, Chinese, uh, Diaoyu Tai to the Taiwan government, all of these various island chains, uh, sorry, all these various um, uh, names for the one set of islands, nonetheless should be subsumed under China's claim because the Cairo Conference was the place where essentially these islands had, they would argue, been handed over. Uh, Japan, of course, completely disagrees with this interpretation, and we still have that dispute um, before us. Now, I'm not here to dispute uh, about the, the right or wrongness of this particular argument. That's not the point today. The point is that this sort of argument would have been much, much harder to make two generations ago, because of course, to do that, the PRC of today has to essentially take on board the achievements of the Guomindang of the past and argue that in fact they were legitimate because of course it was Chiang Kai-shek's signature and not Mao Zedong's that was to be found on that Cairo declaration. And this sort of reappropriation without it necessarily being officially acknowledged of the uh, Guomindang past is a very, very kind of recurrent theme within the reclamation of World War II memory. Another example of that, by the way, is the controversial film which I do discuss in the, the book Bye Bye, the 800, which you may know came out last year, a big hit in China. The story of a last stand of a group of nationalist Guomindang soldiers against the Japanese in 1945. And it was that Guomindang element that had been controversial enough one year earlier in uh, 2019 uh, to actually have the film banned. Uh, and it was kept under wraps for more than a year before it was finally released. So, as I say, the CCP's reappropriation of the Guomindang past is neither complete nor always consistent, but it's very much part of the formula in a way that would simply have been unimaginable 
in as late as the 1970s. Uh, this is something that really emerges only from the early 1980s. It emerges for a variety of reasons, I think, by the way. Uh, one is the desire for reunification with Taiwan, the feeling that being nicer to the Kuomintang on the island would be a good idea. Another is a desire to put pressure on Japan in international society. And a third, and perhaps the most significant, I think, is to do with the destruction of ideological belief at the end of the Cultural Revolution and the need to find a new patriotic narrative which people like Hu Tiamu were very keen on doing, that would bring together both communist and non-communist participants into a more sort of nationalistic um, shared experience. And for that, World War II became a very important part of the mix. But as I've said, just because the state says something and decides to reappropriate part of World War II history, doesn't necessarily mean that everyone either gets with the program or agrees. And the Cairo conference had some strange afterlives during this period. So as I've said, a lot of this publicity was in the 70th anniversary, 2013. Just to show that there's nothing like a, a bad film to make a good point. Um, actually, it's not a bad film, it's just a slightly tedious film. Two years later, uh, for the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, uh, the movie Kailo Xuanyuan, the Cairo Declaration, was released uh, in China. It was a sort of historical biopic uh, of the uh, negotiations. So that's the real event. And this is the movie version that was released. And as you see from this movie poster, lots of uh, characters there. We've got um, uh, General Tojo, uh, sorry, we've got, um, not General Tojo, we've got actually Hoi Yingqin, I think that's actually meant to be in the, in the middle there. We've got Stalin at the back. We've got Winston Churchill wearing a bow tie. Uh, they were kind of cheapskate on the acting, I think, because as far as I can tell, the... Um, actor who plays Winston Churchill is actually American, which to an English speaker sounds a little unusual, but why not? Why not? Um, but one of the weirdest things was, of course, that Mao Zedong is on this poster. And Mao Zedong, as you will see, was not at Cairo in 1943. He was in Yan'an, of course, and he didn't move out of Yan'an, really. Uh, so just a reminder, nope, that's definitely Jiang Jishu and Madame Chiang Kai-shek. But here on the poster, we have Mao Zedong. How could this be? Well, obviously, this was an attempt by the film company to try and you know, provide a kind of ideologically pure um, appearance to uh, the, uh, the censors and the party, as they thought it. But with the kind of uh, ir irony for which the Chinese internet uh, has become known on occasion, many people inside China who saw this were, not, were having none of it, as we say in, uh, in, in England. And these are some of my favorite parody versions that uh, emerged as a result of this particular movie poster with its um, uh, big uh, portrait of, uh, of Mao Zedong in the middle. So here is a list of other Cairo Declaration posters starring people who also were not at Cairo in 1943, uh, Saddam Hussein, Jack Ma, Barack Obama looking a bit spaced out, uh, Colonel Gaddafi, you know, a whole variety of uh, people, uh, Kim Jong-un, who were not um, clearly part of that, uh, uh, of that event. And the mockery in the end became so great that the film company had to withdraw the poster and sort of redo it in a slightly embarrassed kind of a, kind of a way. So as I've said, although there is definitely a propaganda element in terms of the way in which the war and its effects are uh, being portrayed in popular culture as the means of promoting that agenda in international society. It is not the case that this is always just simply accepted and swallowed without any question by uh, the wider Chinese public sphere. But instead, as I've said, there's the possibility for parody and for, um, I think, uh, pushback against, uh, against some of this. The same happened actually on Weibo when uh, Babai was banned originally. There was a lot of quite unfavorable comment about ridiculous censorship on uh, uh, on uh, on Weibo, which was only you know ended when the movie was finally uh, released. So that's one example, the Cairo Declaration of how a historical event during World War II related to the Kuomintang is picked up and used as part of the CCP's projection of China's contemporary international um, uh, relations, but also how China's kind of wider public sphere which of course is very much dominated by the party, but nonetheless, there is still sort of space either to be sycophantic or to protest within that uh, context, showing kind of rather different meanings that people had about this particular set of, uh, of events. But it's worth noting that that World War II idea also appears elsewhere in China's official culture as well as unofficial culture. One of the most um, obvious examples uh, more than five years ago now was the Victory Parade in Beijing on the 3rd of September 2015 in the center of Beijing itself. And 
This was notable because it's basically to date the only parade of this size and significance in Tiananmen Square, which commemorated an event that was not directly to do with the history of the PRC or the Chinese Communist Party as such. And that was very unusual, along with the presentation of both communist and nationalist. So CCP and Kuomintang veterans uh, in the middle of the ceremony to Xi Jinping, a very public statement about at least some sort of reconciliation between those parts of the past. It's also used as a formulation to try and say something about um, the way in which uh, China pushes particular sorts of territorial claims. And, you know, we know the South China Sea, one of the most controversial areas in terms of China's maritime claims. Well, the post-war also plays a role there. The first emergence of the famous 11 dash line, which is supposed to mark China's maritime boundaries, appears in the immediate post-war era in 1947 as a Kuomintang claim. And the claim comes in large part because of the desire of China to use its power as a, wor a World War II victor to make these sorts of claims. But of course, for the CCP today to use that claim, it has to retrospectively project legitimacy on its Kuomintang predecessor, even though another part of the CCP's legitimacy is based on denying that they see that the Kuomintang were legitimate at all. It's a very kind of difficult balancing act, which basically involves an awful lot of inconsistency in terms of the overall narrative. And sometimes World War II is rejected, even when it actually might help China's uh, narrative about itself. For some time, a variety of quite significant figures, including some in China, were talking about how to define the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, formerly One Belt, One Road, to an international audience. And some people came up with the idea that they should call it China's Marshall Plan, which of course in the West has a rather positive sort of feel about it, at least if you're a liberal. But China turned against this very strongly and quite quickly. And the Global Times, there was that you know great site of, of nationalist discourse, published editorials with titles like, the Belt and Road Initiative is no Marshall Plan of China's. And of course, China specialists, of whom there are plenty on this call, will remember that, of course, General Marshall's um, uh, significance in the Chinese context as the failed negotiator of peace between the communists and nationalists in 1946, and essentially being seen as a sort of cold warrior, uh, is very different from the uh, reputation he has in the Western world um, as uh, the figure who basically used the Marshall Plan to save uh, Europe for democracy, or at least Western uh, Europe. So even when wartime and post-war analogies have a certain sort of uh, potential power uh, in a world where China seems desperate to seek soft power. Interestingly, one occasion which could have done China a lot of good because you know the, the Marshall Plan is obviously a rather favorable comparison in much of the West was unreservedly turned down by Chinese officialdom. So as we come to the end of the, the comments I want to make, so we have you know, time for questions and, and, and so forth, I want to just finish by mentioning why I had called the book China's Good War. I've talked today about, as I say, about international relations and how the kind of remembering of, the collective remembering of that period and the changing way in which it's remembered and the appropriation of previously forbidden parts of history like the Guomindang's um, uh, role in World War II, those all play into that. But I also, in the book, talk about a variety of other areas, including local memories, the way in which popular culture reflects uh, those memories and how social media has changed it, a variety of different, different aspects. The title Good War came essentially as a sort of irony, because some of you will know Studs Terkel, the, the great American oral historian, who back in the 1980s published The Good War, an account of American GIs and their experience in World War II, and contrasting the often horrific experience that they had had with the idea that World War II was the good war, not because war is good in any circumstances, but because it enabled America to create a narrative of freedom and democracy and progress and morality about itself in the post-war world. Well, my argument is that China, rather belatedly, is also drawing on the seemingly inexhaustible moral power of World War II. People in Britain are certainly still using World War II metaphors today, and I think that's true sometimes in the States, and it's certainly true in China. So in that sense, World War II has become China's good war, not because the war was good, but because of its ability to enable China to tell a good story, both to the outside world, 
about China being a founder member of international order in 1945 that fought with blood and treasure uh, in the years of the war and now deserves, like America, to have a place in shaping the international order as it is today, but also in telling a story to China's own people about shared and collective identity, a time of sacrifice very different from the consumerism of the present day, and all of that creating, <coughs> excuse me, what I think is most elusive in China's discourse both to itself and to the world, which is the idea not just of China as a strong power or China as a rich power, but of China as a moral power in the world. That has proved a very, very hard uh, story for China to tell, even though the Communist Party is desperate to do so. And I think that the use of the good war idea and the ideas surrounding World War II have been one part of the way in which they are trying to do that and continue to do that in the 2020s and beyond. OK, thanks very much, Jeremy. I will stop there and let's take uh, questions and, and, uh, and comments. Thank you so much, Rana. That was excellent um, and gave us a lot to think about. I realized when you mentioned that Sonny's question came directly to you that I don't, I, I thought I could see all questions as they came in and would be able to sift through those. It was, it was perfectly, them, sense, perfectly good question, but it came in as a direct message, I think, to me, so I, I can great. receive that people want to. It's fine. Okay, so um, I will, uh, I'll go ahead. Actually, we've got a question from Fred. Um, does the CCP believe that the rest of the world will buy the inconsistent claims of appropriating the nationalist territorial claims while delegitimizing nationalist leaders like Chiang Kai-shek? Or is this a talking point aimed at a domestic audience? Thanks very much, Fred. Great, great question. I, I think that the talking point is aimed both at a domestic and an international audience. With the domestic audience, it has a lot more valency and capacity to convince. And as I say, I only talked about a small amount of, of, of the way in which this is, is, is being done. But if you think about everything from, well, popular culture is part of it. Of course, a lot of the popular culture is, is you know, has to go through official uh, censorship and so forth. So when you see a TV series uh, in China that are kind of glorifying the Sino-Japanese war, it doesn't necessarily mean that anyone's watching them, even though actually they tend to get very high um, ratings because it's also a commercial enterprise. But the reason that I think it does have valency is the research I did on what people, you know, actually think about it in terms of their own family histories, for instance. And it's very clear that because during the Mao era, it was almost impossible to talk in open discussion in detail about the Kuomintang and their role in the war. So if you lived somewhere like Chongqing, the wartime capital, or if you lived in Sichuan or one of the southwestern areas of China that were always Kuomintang territory, never really CCP until after 1949, for you, it was very difficult to tell those stories in any kind of open forum, although it was, of course, uh, possible to uh, to do so um, in private families, you know, the, the dinner table or, or whatever. So that being the case, when it became more possible for these other reasons I mentioned, when the state, when people like Hu Mu started to open up the discourse in the 1980s and 1990s, it did become convincing because it basically linked to many people with a story that they had told at home but were not allowed to tell in public. In other words, it resonated with something that was, was real. And that I think did have a powerful effect. And again, I talk in the book about things like, uh, you know, TV chat show hosts who basically use social media campaigns to try and get justice for veterans who hadn't got their pensions. I mean, that, that sort of thing. In terms of international audience, uh, the short answer is no. It's not doing very much, I think, to uh, reshape the discourse, much though I think China is, is, is trying. And when I say trying, you'll hear frequently, you know, Wang Yi, the foreign minister, talking about uh, how China was one of the first signatory to the 1945 UN Charter, for instance. That's part of that discourse as well. The reason, <coughs> excuse me, the reason I think that it doesn't work very well internationally, there's two parts. Number one is China was really much more able to try and get sympathy for itself when it was what it was in World War II, which was a country that had been invaded and was genuinely fighting back against tremendous odds. And, you know, we are all, I'm sure, glad that China today is a much better off and, and more stable country than it was in the 1940s by some way, but it's no longer an object of pity in the way that it was in the 1940s. So summoning up sympathy for that 
40, 50 years later or 70 years later is, is harder to do. I should say 40 years after the events ended is sort of when this really started. The, the other element is that you want to think again, again, I talk about this somewhat in the, in, in the book, about what the moral message of the World War II experience is supposed to be. And by that, I mean that if you take something like Frank Capra's you know, famous Why We Fight movies, which were shown to U.S. audiences during the war, they come up with this, you know, essentially a story about democracy, liberty. I mean, at the end of Why We Fight, at least the China episode, Frank Capra, the immensely famous director, you know, has the Liberty Bell ringing at the end. Now, I think very few people in China, at least on the ground, were fighting for liberty and democracy in the sense that Americans would have understood it. But the wider discourse, you know, the idea of World War II as a war for freedom and democracy was one that was very important to the Western powers. The problem is that since China today is not only not a liberal democracy, but makes no claim to being one, essentially, if it's making the argument that its success in World War II 75 years ago was to create the China of today, it's essentially saying that we fought the war for welfare-driven authoritarian consumerism or some combination of those terms. I mean, for lots of people in China, as we know, that's actually quite a good deal. I mean, you know, many, many people in China are not that bothered about uh, democracy. But the fact is to an international audience, saying that something is, you know, a war for democracy just sounds a lot better than it's a war that means that you can, like, get a mortgage. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't have the same sort of resonance. And that's one of the reasons I think why that internationally oriented part of it um, has not worked so well. One final note on that, by the way, if just attempt perhaps a few people into going into the book. Um, as you may have been able to tell just from my short talk, I am a great fan of very bad movies, whether they are made by Chinese or, or others. I'm, you know, completely uh, fair and objective and even in this. I love bad American movies. I love bad British movies, bad Chinese movies. There are really a lot of bad Chinese movies about World War II. And I have a section in one of the chapters about attempts to try and convert the West through movies, one of which I won't detail here, but let's just say it involves Bruce Willis, Mel Gibson, Fan Bingbing, and a tax scam. So if that tempts you, please do go and check out the book and you'll find out more. I'll take the next question, it. Jeremy. And I, I, I do have a student who, who actually saw that movie. So that was, uh, um, so somebody, somebody went in there tied a rope around his waist and went in there for the rest of us. Um, Indeed. Indeed. Uh, I have a question from uh, Zheng Xiaowei, who's over at UC Santa Barbara. Um, thanks for a great talk. I'm intrigued by the term new nationalism. Is the new nationalism, I assume it came after 1987, qualitatively different from the nationalism before this point? Why do we use the word new here? Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Xiaowei. It's great to, to have your question. Um, I would say the newness, well, there's two things. One is, I'm afraid part of it is, is a marketing ploy, I will, will freely admit, because I did want to stress in the title for people who you know may not be China specialists that this is a book about now. That, by the way, goes back also to Sunny's very good question about why the flag on the front is, is the PRC flag and not the ROC flag. This is a book about China in the last 40 years under the PRC. It's not a book about the Republican period. It's a book about how the Republican period and the wartime period has shaped what is happening in China and has happened during the reform era. So, you know, it's very much a book about that. If one wants to read a book about, if you want to read my book about uh, World War II in China, Jeremy kindly mentioned my previous book, Forgotten Ally, that's very much that book and it would have absolutely a, you know, a Republican China flag on the, uh, uh, on the front. But beyond that, in terms of new, you know, what changes in the 1980s than before? And I would come back to one word, and I'd love to you know, discuss on this because you may not may agree, class. In the Mao era, you know, China was a nationalist state. Maoism was a highly, highly China-centric and nationalistic ideology at the same time as being internationalist in much of its intention. But the one thing that really shaped its language and shaped its assumptions was the assumption of class struggle. And that, of course, found itself manifested in a whole variety of different campaigns during the Mao era, not least, of course, the Cultural Revolution. I would say that to some extent, well, to a significant extent, actually, what makes the war discourse new after, let's say, about 1981, that's really when it begins to take off. And it's not just Hu Qiaomu, but to those of you who know China, you know, Xiaowei, you obviously do. Um, uh, Liu Danyan, the historian uh, and you know, former Yan'an veteran as well, was also a very important figure during this time. They are for the first time in decades not talking about a nationalistic discourse that involves class. They're talking about one that involves both cross-class 
um, uh, alliances, and also one that is essentially cross-party. That's the point of bringing the Guomindang back in. They never say, you know, the Guomindang were not as bad as we said. They, they can't quite say it in that way. But they do make it clear that the Guomindang have a significant role, and that's a real shift in terms of formulation, because, of course, the Guomindang are largely portrayed between the 19... 30s and the 1980s as a class enemy first and foremost so i think my short answer to your very good question is is there anything new there i would say yes the subsuming of class under nation rather than class being part of nation thank you rana um and we did just get another question from ricardo sure. Uh, what would be China's underlying premise for economic and cultural dominance if the hemispheres uh, are like oil and water? Why not the balkanization instead of globalization? Just so the, the question is, what would be China's premise for, for domination? Yeah. Um, well, my own feeling is that right now, if you look at what China is trying to do in the world, and by the way, some of you may have had a link and if not, please feel free to, to look it up, to a piece I had in the most recent edition of Foreign Affairs called The World China Wants. And in that piece, I've tried to answer essentially the question that your, your question has just put, uh, put there, Jeremy, which is essentially, is it right to think of what China's trying to do as world domination? I don't think it is. That's not to say that China is not seeking to have very strong authoritarian influence in a whole variety of areas, not least in its own backyard, in particular in the Asia Pacific region. But I think that its methods and its motivations are very different from a classic empire. I don't think China is looking to be an empire in that sense, because it's not looking to, I think, create Soviet or, you know, even liberal style, a, a sort of reinvention of itself to transmit to other places. You know, even someone like Myanmar, where there was a coup just now, um, my strong suspicion is that, first of all, I would be surprised actually if China was behind the coup, because actually China doesn't really care whether countries are democracies or um, authoritarian per se, as long as they're stable and they look after China's money, which is one of the reasons they got really ticked off when uh, the Russians invaded Ukraine 10 years ago, because a lot of the uh, uh, Chinese investments in Ukraine looked like they might be in danger at that, uh, at that point. On the other hand, China will not do anything much or at all to restore a liberal order if it is toppled through actions taken indigenously. So, you know, don't expect any Chinese help in terms of getting Aung San Suu Kyi back uh, to, to power in Burma. I think that, that ain't going to happen because the generals will make sure that China's economic interests are maintained. So rather than talking about China as a power which is seeking to impose or influence its own model around the world, because I don't think that is the case, I would say, and do say in that piece, that China is a society which is seeking to spread a variety of values and influences that can support democracy but offer no assistance to it. And if there is an ideological element, and I think there is, to what China's trying to do. I think it's that formulation I, I used in a slightly different context earlier. China is essentially pushing forward the idea of a sort of collectivist, authoritarian, welfareist, um, developmentalism. In other words, collective values subsumed to economic growth above all. These days it's green growth rather than simply, you know, pollute all you can and, um, uh, and make the money. But the idea is still very similar in that, in that sense. And it's that set of values that I think is probably the most powerful element that China wants to promote around the world, certainly in its own backyard. I would say, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America and other places too. But I would be wary of making, of, of assuming that automatically makes it incompatible with other systems of governance, by which I mean, if there are authoritarian regimes that already exist, Democratic Republic of Congo might be one in that, in that um, uh, category, then China ain't going to, um, isn't going to do anything to uh, bring democracy back to uh, full democracy back to, to Kinshasa. On the other hand, in Latin America, a continent which, despite everything these days, has really quite a large number of, you know, essentially established democracies, Brazil, Argentina, uh, you know, many other countries in the in, in the region, with a couple of exceptions like Venezuela, are essentially democratic in, in, in form now. China has a lot of influence there economically in terms of telecoms, Huawei, 5G, 
uh, investments, exports of Brazilian soybeans to China, all of this. But I do not at the moment see that that is leading to interference. It actually leads to the change of form in terms of the uh, of Chinese interests. Rather, you can see that there's a great deal of lobbying to try and get China's interests looked after, but within the context of elected politics. In a way that, of course, plenty of other powers, not least the United States, have done in Latin America and elsewhere for decades and decades, and certainly did during the height of the Cold War. Jeremy, I'll throw it back to you. To you. Thanks, Rana. Um, uh, we've got uh, a little under 10 minutes remaining, and I want to remind everybody to please uh, send their messages uh, in through the chat, or you can go ahead and raise your hand uh, if you're a, a named user, and you can, you can ask a question there. Um, Jacqueline uh, asks, in what ways, if any, do international relations affect the work you do in China? Well, oh, that's an interesting question, Jacqueline. Thank you. Um, well, I think at the most crude level, it's always important to note that when your own country is in the doghouse with China, and most liberal democracies end up in the doghouse with China at some point. Australia is currently, I think, the kind of, you know, eye of the target, but the UK has, you know, more than once found itself uh, in trouble, most recently having made the decision that they would allow Huawei to supply the UK 5G network about half a year later, uh, in the middle of 2020, that decision was reversed. And now it's clear that the UK won't allow that. Um, so I would say that, you know, countries go through these phases with China. But I'd say that, uh, for at least for the moment, for people involved in education, and probably in the major Anglophone countries, we probably have a bit of an advantage if we want to take it up, because there's still this huge hunger for the, amongst many of the Chinese middle class to make sure that their kids get to go, if not to a Western college, at least to Western graduate education. And while very often, even now, that means the United States, although it became a little colder under President Trump for, for, for Chinese students um, in, in, in the US, that may change under President Biden, not, not, not clear yet. Um, the UK, you know, as also a major global level provider of high quality higher education has always had, I think, quite a valued place because it's it's one of the few things that's a bit more difficult for China to get round. And it's like, you know, if you, there are various places around the world that can supply iron ore if you really don't want to get it from Australia, but actually getting high quality higher education that Chinese middle class consumers rate highly is limited to quite a small number of places. You know, the Anglophone countries I've mentioned, Singapore maybe, uh, you know, there are a few other places too. But for those who do teach and study and work in those countries, I think we are in perhaps a position to some extent to be able to say that we've got a product that China wants and that China is not in a position to have it all its own way in terms of trying to in any way alter the way that we do what we uh, we do. So we hope that those sort of diplomatic aspects of international relations pass mostly above our heads. But in terms of day-to-day -day encounters, we provide unashamedly liberal education in the UK for our 200,000, 100 to 200,000 Chinese students here. And we have no intention of stopping doing that. And to be absolutely fair, nobody on the Chinese side has yet asked or tried to stop us doing uh, doing that either. Thanks, Rana. Um, I want to uh, pull rank and, and ask a quick question here. Please. Uh, and that is uh, talking about uh, bad movies. I also was wondering about, about good movies. I, I sure. um, About 20 years ago, uh, uh, Jiang Wen's film Devils at the Doorstep came out. Ah, yes. I'm wondering if you saw Gui that. Zalala. And is there a place in, yeah, Gui Zalala, is, is there a place in the future for an increasingly confident regime that allows um, that, that, that allows films to, to sort of, you know, buzz around like mosquitoes, you know, mild annoyances, uh, but, but are allowed to be released? Or is there going to be an increasing anxiety about these kind of voices? And, and I, asking historians about the future, I know uh, sure. it, it's not a favorite thing, but, but do you think there's a future in which more films like Gwede Lilac can be made, uh, this, this very nuanced and complex uh, film, um, or are we heading the other direction? Yeah, and I mean, Gwede Lala, I mean, it, it, as you say, it is a sort of rarity in a sense because it's about, you know, the Japanese invasion of a village and it's not just about sort of everything being burnt down and pillage and plunder, but actually the, the two sides get on quite uh, quite well. And, uh, you know, the, the collaboration with the enemy is one of those stories that actually is the part of wartime China, is as a part of all wartime societies, France, uh, you know, Ukraine, whatever it might be. Uh, but of course, it's not really very politic to talk about it in official circles in uh, in in China. Um, 
And there are other films, I mean, again, although it's not quite the same sort of dilemma. I mean, Nanjing, Nanjing, which uh, by Lu Chuan, which I think is one of the, the great, you know, movies uh, about World War II. Uh, I should say I like good movies as well as bad movies, not, not just the bad ones. Um, and that film, I mean, I think from what I understand, came very close to actually being banned because it had a quite sympathetic portrayal of Kadokawa, the Japanese officer in it, who essentially, you know, kind of can't bear what he and his fellow soldiers have done in, in Nanjing, but it's not simply a kind of blood and guts fest by, by any means. So there, are, there is space or has been space for these films. Is there going to be space in future? Um, I hope so. But I must say, you know, it is worrying to see how narrow and constrained many of the areas of discussion for art are becoming in China as for so many other things. I mean, I've mentioned more than once, we'll say again, you know, The 800, Ba Bai, that, that movie which was released last year. It's worth noting that it was banned for a year before it was released. And it's not like there's a whole bunch of other movies like that, I think, out at the, 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 the moment. It does seem at the moment that things that maybe don't fit into a really quite narrow straitjacket of interpretation are becoming harder to make. Because I think one of the reasons actually that uh, 800 was released was that it cost so much damn money. You know, it was like 80 million US dollars or something. It was China's first ever, I think, all round surround IMAX movie. It's quite a spectacle to uh, uh, to, to see. And I think there's probably some pressuring saying, look, you know, it's not like it's a dissident production. It's produced by uh, Guanghu, it's uh, Huguan. It's, um, you know, a major multi-million blockbuster movie that's supposed to start the Shanghai Film Festival. So just basically canning $80 million worth of movie and saying, ah, sorry, guys, next time, clearly wasn't going to work out either. But most films, I think, are not in that category. And one wonders whether kind of smaller, more interesting productions, in some sense, might now never be started, let alone not finished, because of the, the chilling of the of the atmosphere. We must very much hope uh, hope not. I have to say, the, um, the, the I've got, I think, also in the book, the, the, the director, Feng Xiaogang, was doing a speech overseas somewhere and complaining about the level of censorship of movies in China and the live feed on Chinese TV suddenly cut him off in the middle of the word censorship, which I have to say, as dramatic irony goes, is pretty much, you know, 10 out of 10 with a star on it. Thank you so much, Rana. I, I do want to wrap up shortly. Um, there is a, th things like the release of Babai since the, the, the release of your book there. And, and of course, the um, the, the, the geopolitics of uh, the pandemic uh, have, I think, definitely um, uh, changed the dynamics to some extent, even within a matter of months. Um, are there any things that you, you would add in terms of, of updating that? Do you think that things are trending toward an increasingly confident or increasingly anxious Beijing? Um, are there any, any things that you'd, you'd like to add to uh, uh, as, as some closing thoughts? <laughs> Yes, I think, I mean, on, on that note, uh, Jeremy, I think that there is a very interesting and to some extent problematic dichotomy that's emerging in China, which is that I think confidence at home, as far as I can see, I mean, none of us will be able to get into China for more than a year, because at least maybe slightly different for US citizens, but British citizens currently, because we're regarded as a COVID hotspot of death, um, are banned from entering the PRC full stop, you know, just no, no, no quarantine or anything, just no, can't come. But from what one could see, and you know, I'm Zooming and Skyping the whole time with Chinese, my Chinese students who are back home in China, uh, things are obviously looking much more normal than they are in much of the West. Uh, there's quite a high level of confidence in the uh, measures that the government's taken. And therefore, domestically, I think having started 2020 in a very bad place, uh, the CCP has probably managed to regain its footing quite successfully domestically. This, though, has teamed with, I think, a really severe downturn in China's international reputation, not just because of treatment of COVID, but because it's been so closely linked to this very confrontational diplomacy around the world. And you know, the most recent, well, interestingly, uh, the most recent polling that has been taking place in the UK, and, you know, obviously I'm speaking from here rather than the US, but uh, on what British people think of China is about sort of a 30% favorability of that. It's really kind of very, very, very low in that, uh, that sense. And in some places, even lower than, uh, than that as well. So um, similar, I see similar kind of sentiments in you know, most of Western Europe as well. This strong feeling that actually China has been using its growing kind of standing and confidence at home to push forward a much more confrontational view of itself. I hear also the more thoughtful Chinese diplomats, including, you know, Tsui Tian Kai, the um, Chinese ambassador to the United States, in fact, 
saying, you know, worse the effect of hang on guys, you know, when I think he hears some particularly uh, fiery statement from parts of the, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, pointing out that this may not be the best way to actually create a new relationship. The Biden administration, of course, has a chance to recast its relationship with China. And while I think that the language is going to be more sober than in the days of President Trump, the kind of decision that actually indulgence of China is no longer going to be, you know, part of the, the U.S.'s armory of, of tactics. Seems to be much more, you know, um, at the at the center of that kind of planning. So, I would uh, I would say that um, China has many reasons to be confident about COVID control, about poverty reduction, about other things too, but not least because of its self presentation abroad, and also. You know, the issues surrounding the, uh, the shutting down of freedom in Hong Kong, the camps in Xinjiang, and other things which just come up every single time China comes into the news. It really annoys the China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs because they, 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 they have this sort of odd formulation that China is a global power, but you can only talk about some of the things that China does. So they're very happy to talk about poverty reduction, very happy to talk about, you know, 5G and, and tech innovation, but not about the individual civil liberties issues. And of course, America didn't get away back in the day with talking about saying, we invented space rockets, don't talk to us about race. And similarly, China, as it you know, sends satellites to Mars and um, as it um, seeks to talk about poverty reduction around the world as an important part of its portfolio, we'll also have to learn to talk about its internal politics in a way that's much less confrontational and much more willing to be a part of a genuine dialogue than it does uh, now. So let's hope that's what we see in the next few uh, years. Not sure I see much sign of it yet, but you know, those of us who've been watching China for a long time know that things can change and go up and down over, over a period. Thank you, Rana. And a last question is because I know uh, how much uh, my students really delighted in reading China's Good War um, and also uh, a forgotten ally. Uh, and so they'd like to they'd like to know what's what's next. What are you working on? Well, kind of them to ask. Um, I'm currently in the midst of looking at the, the following decade. So from 1945 to 50, so following on from Forgotten Ally and the World War II period. And while I think the Civil War during that period, of course, is, is very crucial and important, and I'll be you know, writing about that too, it's also the first, you know, it's, it's sort of the dress rehearsal, you might almost say, for what China later became. You know, it's when China first enters international society. It's a time when it first starts thinking about, you know, what kind of um, systems are able to maintain, you know, hybrid or uh, semi-authoritarian systems of, of, of government. Lots of very interesting debates go on during that period. Uh, and I'm trying to grapple with some of those at the moment. It also gives me the chance to do one of my favorite things, which is to read diaries of Republican era politicians and find out just what was on their minds at their times, which uh, is always um, revealing, if on occasion, sometimes uh, a bit uh, dispiriting as they hurtle towards 1949 and then beyond as well. Thank you so much, Rana. It's been a, a real pleasure uh, and, a, and a privilege and honor to, to uh, host you here. I wanna thank everybody who logged in um, and uh, we get some, some uh, virtual applause there from the, from the crew. Uh, so thank you so much. I, I, I really enjoyed talking with you and I, uh, I hope we can uh, talk again in person soon. I'm sure we will. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for your invitation. Thank you for the whole group for joining us here today. And thank you for taking the time to read China's Good War. And I hope to meet and talk with you in person or some other means in, in future. So we'll keep the dialogue open and have a great California morning from this Oxford evening. Thank you, Rana. Take care.